kaya ngayon Europe nun ang teacher worker teacher walya ba pa buja teacher wajak buja ngayon niya Europe nun ang teacher worker lin kaya ngayon ngayon wangi wangi niya ngayon buja I know you've already had a welcome to country but uh, that's my opening and I uh, always like to acknowledge country acknowledge the the spirit of buja the spirit of the land that uh, that we as custodians uh, this is still new our country this is still Aboriginal land. Uh, we, uh, it's great listening to the minister speak. Every time I hear her speak, uh, she does speak our language without speaking Yuma. Uh, I like what she says. I like the way she says it. I like the way she thinks. And it's very interesting listening to Ray as well. I think there was a, uh, so I think it's, it looks like a great forum. So it's great to be along here. Thank you, Blair, for, for uh, inviting me to, to participate. <clears throat> So as Blair, I've, I've actually got a bit of an ear problem at the moment. So I'm actually deaf in this one ear, so it seems really weird because it just happened uh, this morning when I woke up. Um, I, uh, so just to give you a background, we, we've uh, acquired through the Indigenous Land Corporation uh, a, a property out of Beverly. Uh, currently there are, uh, there are about 30 ILC properties across the southwest. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many nationally, but it's a... Uh, it's a quite a, it's a really big program that was set up uh, predominantly for Aboriginal uh, traditional owner mobs who had lost or who lacked the capacity to acquire land through native title. Um, some of you may remember John Howard uh, brought up his ten point plan back in 1993, I think it was, or 94, might have been a bit later, uh, where he said that wherever freehold title existed, it immediately extinguished native title. So that pretty much wiped the whole of the southern half of Australia uh, for our, those Aboriginal traditional owner groups. So the Nunga people, uh, some of you may know, we've been uh, fighting our battle for uh, nearly 20 years, or well, actually longer than that, but uh, this current <coughs> fight that we've been having has been going on for about 20 years. We've uh, now got an alternative settlement to the native title battle that we knew we were going to lose, uh, and soon the, the Nunga settlement, the Southwest settlement, will be rolling out uh, towards the end of this year. There will be seven new corporations, uh, something like 350,000 hectares will be handed uh, across to Nyunga people for joint management, predominantly in the Crown land, so the, uh, the parklands and the native forests uh, that, it, that currently exist uh, will be jointly managed pretty, pretty much through DBCA, the old uh, deep or calm. So our property is, uh, is, um, is um, uh, extra to that, and the ILC properties are pretty much uh, uh, because they're farming lands in the southwest, uh, our properties in the southwest are pretty much freehold title. So what we've been doing with our uh, with our place, um, so Yarraguar Enterprises is my family corporation. It's a family. It's a it's a Balladong, um, family based cooperative. Uh, I've got a big family, um, just my immediate family. I've got ten brothers and sisters. Uh, from my mum and dad, that sort of just very quickly goes to about 105 people. So we've got five generations. So. Once you start throwing in all the other Nyungar names, uh, we've got a family, immediate family of about 5,000. So my kids keep asking who we're we related to. I just go, well, just ask them where they come from. They come from the wheat belt, they're our mob. Uh, so Mangata Baladong is uh, obviously Baladong is our language group within the Nyungar nation. Uh, Mangart is the, is the sacred tree for our people. It's actually one of the, uh, we were known as Mangata people, and the, the Mangara tree is the York jam, uh, the acacia canada species of which on the uh, property uh, of, that we're uh, about to explain what we're doing, um, the, the Mungar tree is a significant uh, uh, dominant species as it was uh, prior to, to settlement. <coughs> Yarraguai is just a combination of the Yarran and the Maguire clans, which is my mum's family, the Yarrans, and Maguire is obviously our small. Uh, this is a, just an acknowledgement, and I think the, the beautiful words, um, uh, they were taken from um, one of my brothers actually acquired them. Um, his name is Seal and Gala, who I know has done a lot of work around here at, uh, with the Wallyabuck mob. Uh, lives down in Kubla. Um, and Seelan's grandmother and my grandmother were sisters, which through our kinship structures uh, makes us uh, brothers. Uh, and the trilogy of Nyungar, um, the Nyungar nation, Nyungar identity is, is uh, Buja, Kort, uh, sorry, Buja, Mort and Karajan which are the three headings up top there, country, family and, and knowledge. Um, our granny and this old lady, was, her name was Yurlene. Uh, she said this is a, these are places where you find serenity, where you find a sense of belonging, that this is a part of our place and these places become a part of our area, our spirit and our culture. We call this 
As Nyungar people, we call this whole concept Buja. So it's not just land or country. It's everything that makes us who we are. It gives us our identity, our spirit, and it, uh, it guides us. Um, Okay, so the words Nicha Buja Kunya, Nicha Kulbarang in Ya Buja Kalak Maya Kani Kunya, Wa Demanga Mamanga Kuen, Kaya Muda Kunya, Demanga Mamanga Nunukut Buja, Kunyan Kaya Kunyan Kala Kulin, Kulanga Buda Nien and Yen, Balaba Wear, Nicha Buja Barang. Now those words say that this is my country where I belong. This is Demanga Mamanga, my grandmother and my grandfather's land. This is their land where their spirits move now. Buddha, or later on, this is going to be the responsibility of my children and my children's children. Their home in this place will always be linked to their spirit. So that is a philosophy that actually you know, flows right through all the work. It, it, it inspires me um, all the time. And it's driven us as Yaragua to take a bit of land that um, uh, I think everybody knows out in the wheat belt. It's pretty marginal country. It's been over, over farmed, to be totally frank. Um, it's been cleared of all of its you know, pretty much all of its vegetation. It's been over-fertilised, as the Minister was saying, uh, over-cropped, over-grazed, you know, and, and it's been damaged. And, and it's damaged everything in terms of the spirit of the land itself. So we started, we got our 2,100 acres, and straight away we wrote a, a vision to plant a million trees, just as a target. And our vision was not so much just about the planting, because we had no idea, uh, we'd never heard of carbon farming, we'd never heard of... Uh, you know, the biodiversity mixes and the environmental management uh, processes and structures that you need to do in healing country in a technical way. All we knew that our land was not well, which made us uh, irresponsible, if you like, as custodians. So we, held, we felt an absolute strong uh, urge and responsibility to heal our, camp, heal our country. So the plan to, was to pl plant a million trees, a uh, biodiversity mix. We chucked in a, a, you know, a couple of hundred, ac uh, hundred acres of sandalwood. Um, which uh, uh, you know Ray was speaking about earlier uh, is an important part of our biodiversity mix, and then we tried to recreate the uh, the natural landscape that was there before. Uh, and I think uh, ten years down the track, I've got to acknowledge Anne Smith, who has been with me right from the beginning. Um, she's been she is now my sister through our kinship structure, even though she's a regular woman. Anne and I went to school, primary school and high school together in Northam, so we've been friends and been connected to each other for a very long time. Uh, there's a few other faces that I see in the audience that have also been uh, part of this journey with us. So I'm just going to, I think a lot of the time, uh, and as Blair said, I mean, I think my mother called me oral for a reason. <laughs> um, so, and standing up here with this little thing, I was actually named after an evangelist. His name was Oral Roberts. I feel like a preacher. Um, so what I'm going to do is, I think, uh, in, in Yunga and Aboriginal culture, we, we like to go to country and allow country to speak to us. And we sing to country through speaking our language, because the language is the la language of the land, wherever we come from, and it resonates with country when we speak it. So when Nyungar and Aboriginal people say we sing to country, we simply speak our language. So what I'm going to do is actually let country speak to you, Mob, by showing you and telling you our story through the pictures that I'll just quickly run through. So this is pretty much the... Um, you know, the wheat belt uh, area that we, um, that we, we know was, uh, was there, you know, um, sorry, that is there now. It didn't look like that 200 years ago. So Avondale Park is, uh, is the Wedula name, Wedula Quela. It's in Beverly. As I said, it's 200 acres. That's uh, our country, Baladong Buja. Uh, that's my mob. Uh, Ngalak and Buja is, this is our motherland. This is the land that uh, belong, that we come from. It, it, it owns us and we are part of it. And Malak Biren uh, Nearing Ba uh, is about us and our project of returning country uh, to bush. So this is a quick uh, slide that I just wanted to show you because this is a reality of what happens on Aboriginal lands. And there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, Wadula people who, and, and non-Aboriginal people who think that Aboriginal people getting all this land uh, that it's all welfare and, and, and it's all easy and it's not accountable, uh, it's not accounted for in, in appropriate ways, that we are under, um, under skilled and, and we lack the capacity and the capability to do the farming that other farmers do. The traditional farming, I think you might call it. Uh, so this is a snapshot of really what happens. And, and when you look at um, many of the, 
you know, the mainstream, this is what happens in terms of land ownership. Uh, on Aboriginal lands, we don't get ownership, right? It doesn't belong to me personally. It belongs to our corporation and there are lots and lots of governance uh, and, and compliance issues around us as a corporation, all right? We can't go like the farmer next door to us to get uh, credit through the bank to get raised finance and capital to do the things you really want to do. So we are bound through this whole process, through the caveats, to actually always be going back to the ILC, always be going back to government, and always be cap in hand to someone to help us do the things we want to do. So over the years, we've been fighting this, myself and a few other Nyungar people particularly, and we've set up the Nyungar Landholder Enterprises Group, which is essentially a, 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 a Nyungar, and it's the first uh, cultural-based uh, landholder group, uh, cooperative group in Australia. So we've been driving that uh, since our establishment in 2015. Uh, there's been a really big push from the Kuris over in New South Wales, Victoria, and the Nungas in South Australia to replicate what we've been doing. So we've now set up an East-West alliance between uh, all of the Aboriginal traditional owners. Uh, and we've been, everything that the Minister spoke about in terms of uh, the books, Bruce Pascoe and, and, and Bill Gamage, these types of books. In Bruce Pascoe's book, he spoke about a grain belt that started uh, at the other side of Karamura and went all the way to the other side of Australia. All right? And it was a, the native grasses. So interesting that the minister speaks about that. We've been talking about it and we're in a process of re-establishing grain belts on, on Aboriginal lands particularly, but also encouraging whitefellas to do the same because it is good for country. And it's, it's good for our, our soils and our animals as well. Um, <clears throat> so these are all the, the elements, and you can see the crosses and the, and the ticks. So uh, most of ours are no, most of the white fellows are yes, and these are the problems that, you know, and the bottom line is at the end of the day, we can't pay wages because we're an Aboriginal corporation, so no one can be employed unless you get approvals from uh, our, our, uh, our chief protector. <laughs> Uh, and, and essentially what we end up is being welfare dependent. So we're trying to break that nexus and actually push governments and the ILC and others to support Aboriginal people to generate our, our own enterprises and maintain ourselves through uh, commercialising the enterprises we want to do, even, even if it's down to the cultural aspects. One of the things that I just wanted to say that I heard, and I've heard several people, I've argued with Anne um, Smith, I'm not arguing, I've debated with Anne many times about uh, environmental values and my view and my belief now, I actually absolutely believe this, that environmental values uh, sit absolutely under cultural values. So when traditional owners take country back uh, and they do it in the right spirits and in within the cultural laws of their culture, environmental values and country gets, gets looked after. Because it's not just the land aspects, it's not just the soil, and the trees and the plants. It's everything. It's the biota, it's the, uh, uh, the, the, the ecology, it's the hydrology, uh, everything within cultural, uh, cultural uh, responsibilities and a, and a custodial responsibility in terms of our cultural values ensures that the environment is returned. So this is a, just a, a, a map of our place. You can see it's a pretty marginal country as I showed you with those photos. But that's the size of our property. Uh, the Avon River, we call that Gogoraja. Uh, it's at the confluence, as you can see, of uh, eight kilometres from Beverley and about 20 k's from York. So right on the highway, um, very good location, and we're pretty proud to, to have this place as ours. That's a previous photo that I showed you. That's what it looks like. It looked like uh, when we first got the property. Um, it's beautiful rolling hills, and obviously this time of the year it's, it's nice and green, and it looks, uh, it looks magnificent. But it's still unhealthy. So we started a process, that's the, uh, that photo, this hill over here on the left will um, sort of pop up I think in a, in a couple of photos later on, but as you can see it's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, you know, damaged property. Uh, the erosion issues uh, are a problem because of the, the topography um, and the vegetation has just been absolutely um, you know, destroyed. We've got a sacred place over here, it's a big granite outcrop, it's uh, magnificent. Um, so we started when we got the property, we didn't know. We, we knew it felt right and we knew it was on our country. Um, but we didn't know what was there because I think probably for 150 years uh, we'd had Nyungas going to this place, this farm, but only to the front 
the, the front of the farm where the shearing shed was. Beyond the farm, Nyungas had not walked on this land for, I reckon, 150 years. So people didn't know. Our people had been disconnected from the heritage, the culture that actually existed there. And we didn't know it was there. When we got it, we just drove to the farmhouse, spoke with the farmers. The ILC then took over the, the negotiation and we acquired the farm 12 months later. And it was 12 months later that my brother and I, my younger brother and I, went there and said, well, this place feels good. Let's go and see what's there. So we walked right across it. Now, we knew that it was on the Avon River, Gorgaja. So we knew there was a connection there to our river, to the, the culture of uh, our waterway, uh, and that was great. We looked at all this, this granite. This country had this really solid uh, presence and energy of this magnificent granite, some of these big boulders. And we thought, there's something about that. As men, we went and looked, because we knew there's something here. What we actually found, uh, and I, I can't show you the full photo of it, but just in that, this area here, we actually found marked in the rocks, and, and Nyunga people are not known for rock uh, art and engravings, but we found, and we knew that when we found one, uh, one image of a, uh, of a male symbol of the, the Kali, the, the boomerang, we thought if this is a sacred place and a significant place for us as men, there will be two other markings in certain directions. And we went and looked and we found them. So now what we know is this is a, uh, a ceremonial ground on the hill directly behind the house. So it's more than just sacred. It's, a, it's now been recognised as a st having state significance for the heritage that we have on this place. So the story I'm telling is really that we didn't know it was there. We acquired it through this really broad government, you know, land acquisition program, and we were keen because we wanted some land on our country. We got this place, and then we started to realise that it was more than just a block of land. It was more than just a farm. And it had more than just, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a good sense about it. It was actually sacred land that was, that was handed back to us. And I, I personally drove it, and I knew and I know now that I was actually led by my old people, by the spirit of my old people, particularly my old men. Lots of magnificent rocks. We found marker trees. Marks, this tree is, is dead, it's laying on, on the ground, but it's still there. The markings are still there. We know these markings. That's a bigger picture of the same, but it's up there. So this, this is the type of landscape we're dealing with. When I said to the real estate, when he was looking for properties for me, I just said to him, mate, the less, if you look at it and think there's no way that you can grow, have sheep there or no way you can run a, a tractor or, or do cropping, I said, if that's the sort of land you're looking at, that's the sort of stuff that we want. And he said, it's, it's pretty rugged country. We found Nama holes. Uh, we found these magnificent uh, stand of boar, of, of, of uh, you know, these, uh, these old uh, grass trees that are tucked away. You can't see them unless you go on the you know, the breakaway country to where no one has gone. There's no tracks there. You have to hop off your, out of your car and walk over the, the hills down to this little valley. Um, we found two, and we certainly know of, two, um, two sites on the river itself. One is on the Avon River, uh, and part of the Avon River Deep Pools. Uh, it's a woman's place, and it's, uh, that place is called Yandjading. It's you'll, you'll see it. Yangedine is what the, how the Wedgelers spell it, but it's a women's place. It's right on the confluence of the Avon and the Dale. And then around the corner is another place on the Dale River. And this place is called Minjalanging. And this is a men's place that's on the river. So this is the heritage. We found this, this, plate, this ochre was right down in the back corner where, again, we didn't, we didn't even know. I think it was like two weeks after we were there that we went to the very back end of the property and just saw this magnificent six colours. This ochre has been now deemed by the Indigenous Affairs and uh, the Senior Heritage Officer at Indigenous Affairs as being having state significance. We know that the Nyungar traded particularly the white ochre and the yellow with the Wongais and the Yamajis from the north and the, the, the east. So significant country, significant uh, heritage. Um, we then started obviously our vision to plant a million trees uh, with, uh, with the plantings. Um, that's how much we've done so far in terms of the, the, the property. Um, so these bits of areas here uh, where the granite is, uh, we've got this part here just down the front, mainly with the, the Murrays, the guys who are leasing from us, they crop that and they crop that. This is all sandalwood. 
and these are all the yellow bits are all trees now, thanks to greening and the support from us. So our vision to, to plant all of our trees is uh, you know is getting there. We planted our first tree, then we planted a few more. As you can see, you know it's pretty. That's that's the country there that, that I'm going to show you now what it looks like. But you can see how how damaged it was and how, and how damaged it is at this point, middle of summer. started to change. The weather changed. Just keep a picture of that, that photo in your mind. Part of what we were doing um, was actually to also introduce uh, burning back to country, traditional burning. Um, I, I did 18 years as a firefighter, so I actually am uh, pretty competent with handling fire. Um, I don't have a fear of it at all. Well, I do, but I know how to deal with it. Um, but it's a different mindset. Traditional burning is about using fire and thinking about fire as a tool, because it's a very important part of our land management here in Australia. And you know, fire brigades, governments, scientists are all now starting to realise what Noongar people and Aboriginal people have been doing for thousands of generations. <clears throat> we call our burning Kalangara. So that's what I've been practising on, on our place. Again, um, that's, this is uh, amongst our trees in our first few seasons and the wild oats um, dominated. It actually strangled and became a massive fire. Fire so I had Wedgel people pulling me up in Northern all the time saying, geez, that, your place is just going to go up one day. So we started our, our program. You can see the height of the trees and, and you know, so it, it was a process of really knocking down the wild oats particularly. Uh, there are other species, as you may or may not know. But when you stand in country amongst the trees and you're burning, as a, as a traditional owner, I think as a human, in fact, there's a spirit in the fire. There's a spirit in the way that you are uh, practising your land management. And you connect to the country, you connect to the fire itself. And it's a, it's a very spiritual, it's a great emotional and spiritual activity to actually get involved in. Um, as a firefighter, I, I, I know the prescribed burning practices. It's all wrong. The way incendiary burns are done, you know, from an aeroplane or helicopter, they annihilate our country. They annihilate Buja. Nothing burns because there's nothing there. So we've got to change that. And I'm working closely with uh, the people that I do still do know uh, about that. I'm speaking at an AFAC conference uh, in a few months' time about the very issue. So, we've got a little, all of these species are, have just regenerated. We didn't plant these. These are native species that once you take the, the, the sheep off country, particularly, um, things grow <laughs> and they appear where you don't even think. Uh, the native grasses, uh, through Greening Australia's advice, Anne and her team, they said, why don't we get some grass seed and start a seed bank where you grow your own native grasses and as you burn, chuck some of these seeds. So we did that for a couple of seasons. Uh, now. We've got, we got this uh, species of grass. So these are all natural stands that are, were, were just taking off because the sheep were taken out of these, these areas. Um, and it, we knew that it was all coming back. We knew that there was a biodiversity that, ex that existed prior to um, colonisation that was still in the soil. We didn't have to do anything. All we had to do was give Mother Nature, you know, give country, give, give the spirit of the land a chance to regenerate itself. Uh, and so we did that. Kwabada Buja is... So that's that hill. That's, this is the transformation. Um, I look at these photos and I ha we, we did this before I, I read the book, uh, Bill Gamage's book, where he talks about the greatest estate on earth. Um, and I, I think that's, this is what Bill's talking about. I presented with Bill uh, and I showed him these photos and he says, absolutely, this is, this is a parkland. He speaks about parklands. We've created a parkland in those places where, uh, you know, it was just a dust bowl basically. It's great for my kids, it's great to have my daughter here today with me um, and she's heading down a path of the environmental science uh, study and, and, and work and she will be one of the key people that will take over from me when I'm old and I'm, I'm amongst the trees, part of the dirt. That's pretty much it. Thank you. By the way, through, through um, the NLE work, 
we are looking at all sorts of... We, we, I'm actually working with the National Trust um, and we are ASI and LE and Balladong mobs. We're also looking in, with support from the Minister and her office uh, to uh, take a shared senior but a shared responsibility for Avondale, the Avondale farm site, which is the old research station. Um, and the Minister and the Department of the National Trust are very keen to support uh, Balladong Yunga to uh, to increase their, our capacity to do bush produce. So all the species she was talking about, the bush foods, the biodiversity stuff, the sandalwood, uh, carbon farming, we're speaking with, you know, Woodside and BP and Shell and others uh, who were also very keen to, in, uh, to buy credits from us. So we, uh, there's a big picture than what we're doing, but this is just about the work that I'm doing on our farm.